As we leave the stomach and begin the small intestine, we need to talk about the contribution of the accessory organs. These would be the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. All of these organs are associated with the small intestine, particularly the duodenum, the very first part of the small intestine, and they all play a role in chemical digestion. The liver is the largest gland in the body, and it's located in the right upper abdominal quadrant. There are four lobes, and the liver is held in place by the falciform ligament and the round ligament. Blood enters the liver from the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein, and exits via the hepatic vein to the inferior vena cava. Blood that comes into the liver enters the sinusoids of the liver for processing. There are stellate macrophages that line the sinusoids. Since a lot of the blood coming to the liver is coming straight from the digestive system, the macrophages can clean the blood of bacteria and debris. There are numerous hepatocytes in the liver, all with different functions. The liver secretes about 900 milliliters of bile daily. It processes the blood-borne nutrients, doing things like storing glycogen or manufacturing plasma proteins from amino acids. The liver stores the fat-soluble vitamins and detoxifies a number of drugs and ammonia from protein metabolism. The bile it produces is a yellow-green alkaline fluid that contains bile salts. Bile salts are used to emulsify fats to aid in digestion. Many substances in the bile are excreted in the feces, including cholesterol. The chief bile pigment is bilirubin. Bilirubin is a breakdown product of hemoglobin. Hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver, and it's usually caused by a virus. There are six viruses, hepatitis A through F, that are involved in hepatitis. Hepatitis A and hepatitis B are enteric forms of hepatitis. B, C, and D are all bloodborne. The enteric types of hepatitis are usually self-limiting. You're over those in about 10 days or so. The bloodborne ones are chronic. Non-viral hepatitis is usually alcohol or drug-induced or may be induced by wild mushroom poisoning. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, is the most common liver disease in North America. It affects about 30% of the general population and about 70% of the obese population. Obesity and insulin resistance are associated with abnormal lipid metabolism and liver inflammation. This particular disease has no symptoms, but it does predispose the individual for cirrhosis of the liver and liver cancer. Cirrhosis is what occurs in the last stage of progressive chronic inflammation. Chronic hepatitis can be due to alcoholism, NAFLD, or infectious hepatitis. Hepatic cells can regenerate, but the connective tissue cells regenerate much faster. The liver becomes fibrous with scar tissue. The scar tissue will then obstruct blood flow and portal hypertension will result. The only effective treatment is a liver transplant. Since the liver can regenerate itself, a living donor can give a portion of their liver to someone else. The donor's liver will regenerate and the small piece of liver donated to the recipient will also grow into a large functional liver. The gallbladder is a muscular sac on the underside of the liver. It stores bile that's not immediately needed for digestion. The liver is constantly making bile, but we don't always need it, so this is the storage reservoir for that bile. While the bile is being stored, it will be concentrated. Some of the water will be absorbed and some of the ions will be absorbed. When needed, the gallbladder will contract to expel the bile into the cystic duct so that it can be delivered to the small intestine. Bile is the major route for excreting cholesterol from the body. An inflamed gallbladder or cholecystitis is usually due to gallstones. Now gallstones occur when there's too much cholesterol and too few bile salts to keep that cholesterol dissolved. Gallstones will obstruct the flow of bile from the gallbladder. The crystals are sharp and so when the gallbladder contracts trying to empty, there's a lot of pain generated. There are several treatments for gallstones. You can dissolve them with drugs. You can use lithotripsy or ultrasound to break them up, crush them up so that they can pass through the bile duct. You can vaporize them with lasers, or a very common treatment is to surgically remove the gallbladder. When the bile duct is blocked, bile salts and bile pigments can't get into the intestine. This means they will back up into the blood. Since the primary pigment in bile is bilirubin, which is yellow, this will back up into the blood, causing the patient to appear yellow or jaundiced. 
The pancreas is both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. As an endocrine gland, it secretes insulin and glucagon, which are involved in glucose metabolism. But in the digestive system, we're more interested in its exocrine gland function. It secretes a number of digestive enzymes, proteases, which will perform protein digestion, amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates, lipases, which break down fats, and nucleases, which break down nucleic acids. As we saw in the stomach, the proteases are secreted in an inactive form and only activated at the site of use. Otherwise, if they were active at the point of secretion, they would digest the pancreas. So here we see the pancreas associated with the small intestine, and trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidase are the precursor or inactive peptidases. Membrane-bound enzymes in the intestine will activate trypsinogen to trypsin, and then trypsin will activate the other two proteases. The bile duct from the liver and the main pancreatic duct unite at the hepatopancreatic ampulla, also known as the ampulla of Vater. This ampulla opens into the duodenum. The regulation of secretion here is both hormonal and neural. Hormones, the enterogastrones, cholecystokinin, and secretin play a major role here. Here is the relationship of the gallbladder, liver, and pancreas to the duodenum or the small intestine. The cystic duct and the pancreatic duct unite to make the ampulla of water. There is another secondary pancreatic duct that can release pancreatic enzymes just a little bit anterior to the ampulla of water. The control of secretions is primarily through the enterogastrones, or the enteroendocrine molecules, cholecystokinin and secretin. Those are secreted by the enteroendocrine cells as soon as material starts to enter the duodenum. These are both hormones. They actually get into the bloodstream to get to their target organs. Cholecystokinin induces secretion in the pancreas, the enzyme-rich secretion. Secretin focuses on more of a bicarbonate-rich secretion from the pancreas. Remember, the stomach contents are acidic. We would need to neutralize those, so both the bile and the pancreatic secretions are going to be alkaline in nature. The vagus nerve will weakly stimulate the pancreas during the cephalic and gastric phases, but it's just more like a wake-up call, sort of like food's coming, so get ready to do something. Bile secretion from the liver depends upon the recycling of bile salts from the lower part of the intestine. Secretin plays a little bit of a role in getting the bile released. The gallbladder contractions are caused by cholecystokinin and the vagus nerve. Again, the vagus nerve is a weak stimulator during the cephalic and gastric phases, more like wake up. The hepatopancreatic sphincter, that ampulla of water, is relaxed by cholecystokinin. This means that the fluids that have been stimulated to be manufactured and released can now be released into the small intestine. The small intestine begins at the pyloric sphincter from the stomach. Then there is the duodenum, which is about 12 inches in length, and this is the site of the hepatopancreatic ampulla. The jejunum is about the next eight feet, and then the ileum, the last 12 feet or so. The small intestine ends in the ileocecal valve or the ileocecal sphincter. The blood supply is primarily from the superior mesenteric artery. Both the sympathetic and parasympathetic system sends nerves to it. It is in the small intestine that we complete chemical digestion and do all of the absorption of nutrients. In the small intestine, there are some modifications for absorption. We want to give maximum surface area to the small intestine. Circular folds are deep, permanent folds in the mucosa and submucosa. This makes the chyme spiral through the small intestine, slowing its movement, allowing more time for absorption, and also allowing it to mix and hit the sides of the wall more effectively. Villi are finger-like projections of the mucosa. It gives the mucosa a velvety texture. Each villus contains a capillary network and a lacteal. You'll remember that a lacteal is a branch from the lymphatic system. And then the microvilli are cytoplasmic extensions of absorptive cells of the mucosa. They make up what's called the brush border. And the brush border contains enzymes known as the brush border enzymes. So as we look at the small intestine, we have these circular folds. 
This is going to make the chyme spiral around. And then we have the villi, these finger-like projections, greatly increasing the surface area of the small intestine's absorptive area. Just like in the stomach, we have intestinal crypts. The stomach had gastric pits. In the intestine, they're called intestinal crypts. They're tubular glands, and they're spaced in between the villi. They will decrease in number as we move along the length of the small intestine. The enterocytes make up the bulk of the epithelium. These are absorptive cells. They have tight junctions between them, and their surface is covered with microvilli. When these cells are found in the crypts, they secrete intestinal juice. Goblet cells secrete mucus. This helps lubricate stuff going through the system. And the enteroendocrine cells secrete hormones, particularly the hormones secretin and cholecystokinin. Panis cells secrete antimicrobial agents, things like defensins and lysozyme. There are a lot of bacteria still in the small intestine, and this helps prevent those bacteria from getting into the body. Deep in the crypt are stem cells. These can become all types of cells except panis cells, so we have a way to replace any cell at any time. The cells at the tip of the villi undergo apoptosis and are shed regularly. The epithelium of the small intestine is renewed every three to five days, similar to that of the stomach lining. Chemotherapy is when people take cytotoxins to try to kill cancer cells. These cellular toxins target rapidly dividing cells, so the intestinal epithelium is sort of like collateral damage. They're rapidly dividing cells that take up the toxin just like the cancer cells. Chemotherapy patients usually experience nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea a day or two after treatment. This is because of the massive kill-off of cells that's occurred on the lining of their intestine. Malt tissue is also found in the small intestine, and as we move distally toward the ileum, we increase the amount of malt tissue. The duodenal glands are located in the submucosa. They secrete an alkaline fluid. Again, we're always doing things to reduce the acidity of that initial chyme that comes out of the stomach. If this alkalinity is not maintained, duodenal ulcers can occur. The acidity will erode the duodenal lining. So looking more closely at a villus, we have the enterocytes, the absorptive cells, and they have their microvilli, their brush border. In each villus we have an arteriole, a venule, and a lacteal from the lymphatic system. Goblet cells secrete mucus. We have the panis cells. Here in the submucosa we have the duodenal glands. This is one of the intestinal crypts. We have the malt tissue. We have the enteroendocrine cells that secrete the hormones. In the small intestine, chemical digestion is completed. This is a result of enzymes from the bile and the pancreas. Blockage of a duct or impaired function of one of these organs will inhibit chemical digestion. The brush border enzymes are associated with the absorptive cells, and they are the final chemical digesters of all of the nutrients. We need to regulate how chyme comes into the intestine. This is done by the enterogastric reflex and the enterogastrones. Both of these slow stomach emptying and so reduces the flow of material into the duodenum. Motility in the small intestine is both segmentation, which mixes the chyme with the bile and the enzymes, and migrating motor complexes. Migrating motor complexes are peristaltic activities that help sweep through the system. These are particularly important between meals when we are continually sweeping debris toward the large intestine. The ileocecal valve is normally closed. The gastroileal reflex is a long neural reflex that is triggered by stomach activity. The gastroileal reflex is a long neural reflex that's triggered by stomach activity. This reflex increases the force of segmentation in the ileum and helps relax the valve. As we have more stuff coming into the stomach, we're basically cleaning out the small intestines to prepare for the new incoming material. Gastrin will also increase motility in the ileum and relax the valve. The large intestine has the same four layers that we've seen throughout the digestive system, but of course there are modifications. 
One modification is the longitudinal layer of muscle is not a continuous sheet of muscle, but rather three strands of muscle that are called the tinea coli. The muscle tone of these muscles causes the intestine to pucker so that we have these pocket-like sacs that are called hostra. There are also epiploic appendages. These are little fat-filled pouches that hang from the surface of the large intestine. We don't know why they're there, we just know that they're there. There are five major subdivisions of the large intestine, the cecum, the appendix, the colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. The appendix is attached to the cecum. It contains masses of lymphoid tissue, or malt, and also serves as a storehouse of bacteria to recolonize the gut. Because it is a twisted structure, it makes it susceptible to blockage. Appendicitis is an inflammation of the appendix. It results from a blockage that traps the infectious bacteria in the appendix. The appendix is then unable to empty, and the appendix swells, squeezing the venous drainage shut so that blood can't flow out of the appendix. This causes ischemia and necrosis of the appendix wall, and rupture may occur. This rupture will allow intestinal contents into the peritoneal cavity, causing peritonitis. Symptoms of appendicitis vary, but usually start with pain in the umbilical region, a loss of appetite and nausea, and then finally vomiting. The pain localizes to the right lower quadrant. An appendectomy is the surgical removal of the appendix. The colon starts with the ascending colon, which goes up the right side of the abdominal cavity. It makes a turn under the liver that's called the right colic or hepatic flexure, and then goes across the top of the abdominal cavity just under the stomach as the transverse colon. It makes a turn at the spleen, called the left colic or splenic flexure, and then we have the descending colon that goes down the left side of the abdominal cavity. All of this is fairly anterior in the abdominal cavity. The sigmoid colon then goes posteriorly to connect with the rectum, which leads to the anal canal and the anus. There are two sphincter muscles on the anal canal. The internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle and is involuntary. The external anal sphincter is voluntary, under our control. As we start, here is the ileum emptying into the large intestine. The cecum is this little blind pouch with the appendix attached. Then we have the ascending colon. Here is the right or hepatic flexure. The transverse colon. The left or splenic flexure. The descending colon. All of this is fairly anterior. The sigmoid colon goes back to the back where it joins with the rectum and the anal canal. Goblet cells are a large component of the mucosa of the large intestine. These secrete mucus that help lubricate and protect the intestinal mucosa. There is also a lot of bacteria in the large intestine. Over a thousand different species of bacteria live there. Most of them enter from the small intestine. These are cells that survived digestion. Most of them are beneficial to us. Some of them can ferment indigestible carbohydrates and mucin. When they do that, we get short-chain fatty acids that can be absorbed and used for nutrition. Of course, this fermentation is also responsible for gases and can lead to flatulence. Also, some of the bacteria produce vitamins. B-complex and vitamin K are produced by some of the gut bacteria. The immune system destroys any of the bacteria that try to breach the mucosal layer. But the gut bacteria also instruct the immune system not to overreact to their presence in the lumen. Basically, they're the good guys. They help keep the harmful bacteria in check. The beneficial bacteria far outnumber any harmful bacteria, so they outcompete them. They can't grow because there's no resources left for them. And then the immune system prevents any of them from entering us. Broad-spectrum antibiotics will kill the beneficial bacteria. This will allow organisms that are normally present in the intestine in small numbers to overgrow. One of these is Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile is part of normal intestinal flora, but only very, very small numbers. If you kill off the competing bacteria, then they can grow to numbers that are too great. Clostridium difficile can be transmitted from one person to another via the oral fecal route. Clostridium difficile, when it grows to large numbers, causes pseudomembranous colitis. This can lead to bowel perforation and sepsis. 
The reason Clostridium difficile survives broad-spectrum antibiotics is because it's very resistant to antibiotics. This makes it difficult to treat and it often recurs. The best treatment has been fecal transplant, that is fecal material from another individual, usually a close family member, can be transplanted into the colon either using an enema or a colonoscopy. The remnants of digestion will spend about 12 to 24 hours in the large intestine. No digestion really occurs here except for that minimal amount of bacterial fermentation and very little absorption occurs, only the vitamins that are made from the bacteria. We do reclaim water and some electrolytes in the large intestine, but the primary digestive activity of the large intestine is propulsion to eliminate undigested material from the body so that the last process can occur, defecation. The colon becomes modal when food enters via the ileocecal valve. Large intestine contractions are very sluggish. They're primarily hostral contractions that occur mostly in the ascending and transverse colon. The hostra fill, and as they fill, the walls become distended. This stimulates muscle contraction. The lumen narrows and material is forced forward. Mass movements or mass peristalsis are long, slow, powerful contractile waves over a large area of the colon. They occur three to four times daily. Typically, they are stimulated by the gastrocolic reflex. The full stomach pushes on the transverse colon. This sets up this reflex, causing a mass movement to occur. Diverticula are small herniations of mucosa through the colon walls. They typically occur when the diet lacks fiber and the volume of the residue is very small. The colon narrows and the contractions become very powerful to try to move this little bit of stuff through the colon. This increases the pressure on the colon walls, causing the herniations. Diverticulosis is the condition of having diverticula. Usually these are found in the sigmoid colon of older people. Diverticulitis is an inflammation of the diverticula. In this case, the diverticula may rupture and leak, causing peritonitis. Irritable bowel syndrome is another problem with the large intestine. This is a functional problem that does not seem to have an anatomical or physiological cause. Pain and bloating occurs, flatulent, nausea. The pain is relieved by defecation. Many of the people who experience IBS are depressed or under a lot of stress, and so one of the best ways to treat it is using stress management. The rectum is usually empty. Mass movements will force feces into the rectum. There are stretch receptors in the rectal wall, and when these are stimulated, this initiates the defecation reflex. The rectum muscle contracts, and the internal anal sphincter relaxes. Feces are forced into the anal canal. Then there is the conscious decision to relax the external anal sphincter or not. If defecation is delayed, the stretch receptors accommodate, the rectal wall will relax until the next mass movement forces feces into the rectum. During defecation, the voluntary muscles of the abdomen contract and valsalva's maneuver is usually employed to empty the rectum. With diarrhea, watery stools are produced. This is the result of food residue rushing through the colon before water can be absorbed. Bacteria can cause this to happen, as can prolonged jostling of the viscera. Marathon runners frequently have bouts of diarrhea. If diarrhea is prolonged, dehydration and electrolyte imbalance can occur. Constipation is the reverse of diarrhea. Here the residue remains in the colon too long and too much water is absorbed. This leads to a difficulty with defecation. This can occur if there is insufficient fiber in the diet or insufficient fluid. A lack of exercise, laxative abuse, or waiting too long to defecate can all contribute to the development of constipation. Digestion is the catabolic processes that break down large food molecules to their monomers. This is accomplished by the enzymes that are secreted into the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract by the accessory organs. Most of our digestion occurs in the small intestine. Absorption is moving substances from the lumen of the gut into the body. Because there are tight junctions between the cells, this is not easy. We're going to have to move the materials through the cells themselves. Once they move through the cells, 
they will move into the interstitial fluid and then diffuse into the blood. The blood will go to the liver via the hepatic portal system. Most nutrients are absorbed by active transport. If we look at the cells, we have the apical membrane of the cell and the basal lateral membrane of the cell. The apical membrane of the cell is on the lumen side. The basal lateral membrane of the cell is on the interstitial fluid side. More than nutrients are in the alimentary canal. All of the food stuff in the alimentary canal, 80% of the electrolytes and most of the water are also absorbed. Most of this has been completed by the time the chyme has reached the ileum. The ileum primarily reabsorbs bile salts for recycling. Carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth with salivary amylase breaking down carbohydrates to oligosaccharides. Salivary enzymes are inactivated by the pH of the stomach. Pancreatic amylase will break down starch and glycogen into oligosaccharides and disaccharides. The brush border enzymes then will break the oligosaccharides and disaccharides down into monosaccharides. Monosaccharides are actively transported across the apical membrane of the absorptive cell and then transported across the basolateral membrane by facilitated diffusion. Monosaccharides diffuse into the blood. Large carbohydrate molecules broken down by pancreatic enzymes taken in by active transport facilitated diffusion across the basolateral membrane into the interstitial fluid and then into the blood. Lactose intolerance occurs if intestinal lactase is absent. Lactase is one of the brush border enzymes. This can be either a genetic problem, people are born with an inability to produce lactase, or the result of a reduced production of lactase, and this frequently happens as people age. Lactose cannot be fully digested. This means that it continues to move through the system. It takes some water with it, so water is not reabsorbed as it should be. Once it gets to the large intestine, the bacteria ferment lactose to acid and gas. This causes diarrhea, bloating, flatulence, and cramping pain. Lactase can be given before consuming lactose to alleviate this problem. Protein digestion begins in the stomach with pepsin. Pepsin functions in an acid pH. Pepsin will break down proteins to polypeptides and a few free amino acids. Then the pancreatic proteases come into play. Trypsin and chymotrypsin will cleave proteins to polypeptides. Carboxypeptidases break off terminal amino acids. And the brush border enzymes break polypeptides and dipeptides down into amino acids. Amino acids are actively transported across the apical surface and then cross the basolateral membrane by facilitated diffusion. Amino acids also diffuse into the blood. So again, we have our short chains of amino acids, our peptides, broken down into individual amino acids, actively transported into the absorptive cell, facilitated diffusion out, and into the blood. Newborns may have whole proteins taken across their membrane by endocytosis. This is part of the immaturity of the digestive tract. Because these proteins now get into the body, the immune system sees these proteins as antigenic and mount an attack against them. Once the digestive system matures, the proteins are digested and no longer get into the body, so the intact protein is not seen by the immune system. Typically, children outgrow some of these early food allergies simply because the digestive system matures. Now, we have said that infants get some of their mother's immunity through the IgA in the breast milk. IgA is a big protein. The question has always been, how does this big protein get into the blood? Well, this sort of explains how IgA from breast milk may get into the bloodstream. Lipid digestion begins in the small intestine. Bile is used to emulsify lipids. Lipids are not water soluble, so these big globs of fat have to be broken into smaller droplets. This will allow lipase to have better access to the fat, so the lipase from the pancreas can digest the fats into fatty acids and monoglycerides. Bile salts are also important in the absorption of fats. Fatty acids and monoglycerides associate with the bile to form micelles. These fatty acids also cluster around cholesterol and fat-soluble vitamins. The lipids leave the micelles and diffuse through the cell membranes. 
Once they're inside the absorptive cell, they're converted back to triglycerides, coated with a protein, and become chylomicrons. Chylomicrons leave the cell by exocytosis and enter the lacteals. So here is our large fat globule. The bile salts help emulsify it to smaller little globules of fat so that the pancreatic enzymes can get to it better and digest them, breaking them down. Once we have that, the micelles form. These are, consist of fatty acids, monoglycerides, bile salts, and this allows the fatty acids and the monoglycerides to diffuse from the micelles into the absorptive cells. Once they're inside the absorptive cells, they're repackaged as chylomicrons, leave the cell by exocytosis, and enter the lacteal. Fats do not go into the blood, fats go into the lymphatic system. Pancreatic nuclease will digest the DNA and RNA of any of the ingested cells. They break them down to nucleotides. And then the brush border enzymes break them down to their nitrogenous bases, pentoses, and phosphates. All of these are actively transported across the apical membrane, then diffuse across the basolateral membrane into the blood. The absorption of vitamins occurs in different places in the system. The large intestine will absorb those vitamins that were made there, the B-complex vitamins and the vitamin K. Fat-soluble vitamins are absorbed in the micelles. Most water-soluble vitamins are absorbed via specific active or passive transporters. Vitamin B12 requires intrinsic factor. B12 and intrinsic factor make a large complex that binds to receptors in the terminal ileum. Most electrolytes are actively absorbed along the small intestine, but iron and calcium can only be absorbed in the duodenum. Water absorption occurs by osmosis along the small and large intestine. Malabsorption is impaired nutrient absorption. There are many causes. We can have interference with delivering bile or pancreatic juice to the small intestine. There can be damage to the intestinal mucosa, sometimes as a result of severe bacterial infections, or there can be a reduction in the absorptive area of the small intestine. A common malabsorption disease is celiac disease or gluten-sensitive enteropathy. This is a chronic genetic condition. The immune system reacts to gluten, allowing it not to be absorbed. The treatment is to eliminate gluten from the diet. There are several congenital defects associated with the digestive system. Cleft palate and cleft lip occurs when the palatine bones fail to fuse. This causes an eating problem, but it can be surgically corrected. A tracheoesophageal fistula is when there is a connection between the trachea and the esophagus. When infants eat, the food enters the respiratory system. Now sometimes there is not a connection to the stomach, the esophagus is only connected to the trachea. Other times there is a double connection, the esophagus is connected to both the trachea and the stomach. In either case, surgical correction occurs. In cystic fibrosis, the individual fails to make pancreatic enzymes. We can overcome that part of the disease by simply giving enzyme supplements when they eat. The other part of cystic fibrosis we talked about in the respiratory system. This is the production of the abnormal mucus that causes the respiratory problems. The digestive system operates throughout life with relatively few problems. There are occasional bouts of gastroenteritis, inflammation of the GI tract as a result of viruses, food, or bacteria. Cholecystitis can occur in some individuals, and esophageal, gastric, or duodenal ulcers. But the true issues of old age have to do with a decline in activity leading to more constipation. The taste and smell becomes less acute as you age. Periodontal disease may cause the loss of teeth. Many elderly people live alone and on a reduced income. In general, they tend to be less nourished than they should be. Diverticulosis is more common in the elderly. Fecal incontinence or an inability to control defecation occurs as well. Cancer is always more common in the elderly. Now, digestive system cancers rarely show any kind of early signs, and they easily metastasize to the liver, and liver cancer does not have a good outcome. But when digestive system cancers are detected early, they're very treatable. This is why it is very important to have regular exams for digestive system cancers.